See, and it's interesting because in the, in the magnifying glass, everything's upside down. And it's only when you put the camera before it that it's right side up again. I mean, in a way, the stories and this are connected in the way of, you know, how many layers do we see things through? I mean, that's kind of the question that I, I ask. And when you have these moments of real epiphany, you know, it's like you're seeing without any of these screens, without any of these layers between you and whatever you're seeing. Oh yes, this, this actually, this is Roman. This was from the desert, the western desert in Egypt. And it was amazing. I would have, again, picked up the whole desert if I could have. Their conch, see their little, tiny little conch? They would be growing into conches. And in the bathroom are also all these great things. Sure Have you take, been to the bathroom? I went last time, but I did not oh, notice. Oh, you didn't notice all the great things <laughs> really in the bathroom? Really... So these are all Carl from uh, Vieques in Woodstock. A woman came to my house, a sculptor, and she looked at the big black one. She said, oh, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was very active in the art world from the early 70s. I did a lot of work about uh, the meaning of signs, how signs mean common signs like arrows, and I invented something called pointless arrows. Ascending and descending are based on a perspective slant, like in a photograph, but it doesn't actually exist. The floor is not higher at one end than it is in another end. It doesn't exist except in our minds. So in a way, we've learned to see <laughs> through photographs. I really had to write about my art a lot. <laughs> and it was very complicated writing about language, language and image. And that really got me into writing. And then I did a lot of uh, exhibitions here and in Europe, and I was really kind of getting tired <laughs> of doing the same work. I started thinking about what else could I do, and then I suddenly just wrote these two stories. One of them took place in this building. There used to be gypsies living on the ground floor. Most people were terrified by <laughs> <laughs> and they used to hang their clothes to dry out on the railing. <laughs> One girl in particular didn't like me, or at least I felt that way, and I wrote about her. And the second story I ever wrote was really about my father's suicide, though I didn't name it uh, as that, and nobody really knew what happens in the story. It's very ambiguous. But uh, I didn't know then that that was the reason I really wanted to write, was to explore his death in my life. Because my father was a gambler and there was a hit out on him by the mafia. And he told me the day he was gonna kill himself that he was gonna do that. And um, it was really the event that changed my life. On the morning of March 24th, 1963, three weeks after he took to his bed, my father rose. He shaved, showered, dressed in a familiar dark suit with wide lapels. He's going to work, I thought, relieved, until I looked at him while we waited for the elevator. In overcoat and fedora, head low on his chest, face ashen, eyes unseeing, he said, I'm too old, I can't run from them anymore. 
the truth is, it was never my idea to write a memoir. It was the idea of my agent at the time. She said she had read Running With Scissors, and she said, you're, you're, fa you, you're the only one I ever met who had a family that was as crazy as that one. I'm not coming home tonight, he said. I looked at him, but I could not speak. I was sure I would come apart break into myriad pieces if I opened my mouth. I understood what he said. I knew what he meant. He's not coming home tonight or ever. So this is perfect Ansonia weather. Very gray. <laughs> They lived here independently. They met in this hotel. I don't know how they met or who introduced them. I think I saw once a, a photographs. It was sex, that's all. <laughs> I mean, it, impossible for these two people to be together. But they were married within two months, and my father had been a real ladies' man. He was much older than my mother. And my mother was beautiful when she was young. But um, it's a, you know, it's a uh, landmark. It's a Beaux Arts building, I and mean, it's a beautiful building. But and you just hated living here. Oh, I, you know, I still think it's awful. Um, it was like a Gothic horror house. I don't remember ever seeing another child there. <laughs> there were gamblers. I mean, there were also very famous people who had lived there. Rachmaninoff had lived there. Um, Stravinsky had lived there, a lot of musicians and opera singers because the walls were three feet thick. There were 300 apartments, no two of which were the same. It used to be the Beacon Theater over there uh, where we went to movies and uh, not very much is the same. Though the bank was here, in fact, many of my family photos <laughs> were oddly taken in front of the bank there. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is very funny. He was an electrical contractor in the garment center, which was totally controlled by the mafia then. And he used to supply all the sewing machines for some big factories. But, you know, it was all mafia connected. My father was the positive force in my family. <laughs> the girl is 14. Her father wants her to have fun, he says. He wants her to be easy and outgoing like him. But she is shy and nervous like her mother. Go over and introduce yourself, father urges the girl. He made me his confidant, which is a terrible thing to do to a child. And so he acted like my mother was his mother. And we were like the children playing together, keeping secrets from mommy sort of thing. I mean, he was just a very seductive man. Our apartment on the 10th floor was filled with sunlight when I was young. And my father would let me roller skate back and forth. And the view faced downtown. And we had this wonderful view of Manhattan. And so I would roller skate back and forth because my mother hated it. <laughs> so my father always encouraged me to do it. I was never allowed to do anything. And I had to be with my grandmother every day after school because my mother worked and they were both had OCD, so I wasn't allowed to touch anything dirty. Well, my, my grandmother, of course, was really a racist, and well, so is my mother. I've made amends with my mother. She's going to be 99. They live till like 110 in her family, but she's like 10% conscious. But I see her every week in the nursing home. I mean, she, you know, I, she, she was totally controlled by her mother and never really got out of her grasp, so. When we moved out of here, we had an apartment in Rigo Park, 
which was a whole, I had my own room, it was wonderful. Became president of the class within two months. Across the street was a vacant lot I called Africa, and there were other, other vacant lots as well. So, I mean, whatever I saw there, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, but I did love playing in these vacant lots and having my fantasy life. Here in deep jungle, I poke with a stick behind bricks, banana peels, broken bottles, beer cans, and charred wood beams. I dig beneath old tires, plastic bags, and mattress springs, searching for pink stones more precious than any precious jewel. When I come home, mother slaps my hands. You're filthy, she shrieks and shoves me in the bath. God knows what you touched, she cries out. Her face reminds me of the gray stone gargoyles that scared me once. Mother forbids me to go to Africa again. My travels after school take me further and further from home. Soon the world will be filled with red brick blocks and all my continents will be lost like Atlantis. Well, I got out of the house with my mother and my, my grandmother moved into my father's side of the bed and I left. <laughs> she slept with your mother? In the, in the same bed, yeah, after he died. And I, I left, I moved to, uh, to the village with a friend. My travels were always a kind of uh, way to find him. It was a dream to go to the Amazon um, because I was never allowed to do anything. So I think it was this, ah, I want to get dirty. <laughs> and uh, this was my, uh, my hut. And this was during the dry season and you can see the color of the river, not exactly beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I was very involved with Kierkegaard and his ideas of endlessness and infinity. And, uh, you know, it was a kind of spiritual quest. And that, that kind, that's what started me on my arrows, on my ascending and descending arrows. And my travels have always been a kind of spiritual quest. I, I really wanted to, to conquer my fear, so I really did do things that were scary. And then I felt great after doing them. And I felt very alive doing them because I knew I was going beyond my limits. And here we're fishing for, for piranhas. <laughs> Before I went to Europe in the, in the 60s, I started having all of these amazing experiences and I never took drugs. I never took LSD or any of the drugs that, you know, friends were taking because I had these really experiences of oneness without taking anything. And I think that, in a way, is what uh, determined my becoming an artist. I mean, I kind of always knew I would be an artist, but that clinched it for me. And um, so I, would, I, I worked for a printer many years ago, and during lunchtime, I would walk, it was in Chelsea, and I would walk through, uh, I guess, 20th, 21st, 22nd Street, and I would just have this uh, feeling of total um, that everything in life was perfect and that nothing ever needed to be changed. <laughs>